Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching part one of Epic History TV series on Alexander the Great. Now this series has been recommended many times, and I'm excited that we're finally devoting more time to Alexander, who is a very important and impressive historical figure. Now if you guys have any other Alexander-related reactions that you would like me to do, please leave them in the comments below. Now, if you guys end up enjoying this reaction, I would appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below, and will give you access to exclusive content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. In 334 BC, Alexander, King of Macedonia, began one of the greatest military campaigns in history against the superpower of the age, the Persian Empire. Oh yeah, and this conflict is often listed amongst these East versus West conflicts. And while I'm not sure that designation is super important, that designation is often applied here. Uh, it's one of the many Persia versus any Western power conflicts. Persia versus Alexander, Persia versus any number of the Greek states, Persia versus Rome. And these conflicts will take many different forms throughout classical ancient history, but this is sort of one of the key examples. Just 20 years old, his brilliant and fearless leadership won him battle after battle. Wow, so young! And in an astonishing 10-year campaign that took him to the edge of the known world, he carved out one of the largest empires ever known. Yeah, and this is one of the things that is truly amazing about Alexander, and I think he got even a little bit further than they're showing there. He really reached the edge of the Indian subcontinent, and that's further than I think of Alexander going, so he had a truly massive, massive empire. Few men have had such a massive impact on the course of history. To the Persians, he was Alexander the Accursed. But to the West, he was immortalized as Alexander the Great. Mm. Though Alexander the Accursed, but to my understanding, Alexander did adopt some aspects of Persian politics and culture. Uh, maybe I might be wrong on that. We might see that in this video, but I think he had a complicated relationship with the lands he conquered, in particular the Persian lands. Ancient Greece. From around 500 BC, this rugged land was the scene of remarkable developments in art, philosophy, and warfare. Mm -hmm. A prosperous land, though a land divided into relatively small city-states who would often squabble amongst each other. Its two greatest city-states were Athens, a naval power where democracy, art, drama and philosophy flourished, and Sparta, an austere militaristic society famed for its formidable army. Mm -hmm. In 480 BC, these two city-states had joined forces to fight an invasion by the mighty Persian Empire. Yes, and at this point we're talking about the Achaemenid Persian Empire, which had been founded by Cyrus the Great not even a hundred years before this point, a couple decades earlier. And as you might be able to see from this map, it was a truly mighty empire. And really, one of the few things that could bring these squabbling Greek states together was an external threat, in particular an external threat from the Persians, the powerful Persians. At the narrow pass of Thermopylae, a small Greek force led by 300 Spartans yep. held up the enormous Persian army for three days. Which has become a very famous scene, you know, in the movie 300, the idea of 300 in popular myth. 
And this plays into this idea that I sort of talked about of East versus West, you know, the Eastern Persians versus the Western Greeks. And like I said, I'm not really sure if this designation is too helpful, sort of on a broader scale. I think it leads us to group a lot of conflicts that may not be too related. Um, you, you can look at this in particular, this is the Persians versus the Greeks. You need not necessarily extend further, but these battles, these wars, they've played a pretty important role in sort of, I guess, the Western cultural canon. Before they were finally encircled and killed. Then, in the Straits of Salamis, the Greek fleet defeated the Persian navy. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't prevent the Persians burning the sacred temples of the Athenian Acropolis. The next year at Plataea, the Greeks won a decisive land battle against the Persians and forced them to abandon their invasion. The next 50 years were the golden age of classical Greece. Ah. But rising tension between Athens and Sparta and their allies eventually led to war, dragging the Greek world into decades of destructive fighting. Yeah. Wars between the Greek city-states continued for almost a century. And the Greek city-states, and I suppose Greece as a whole, will often be subject to rule or attack from larger empires. Whether we're talking about Persia, or we're gonna be talking about Alexander in this video, or, you know, the Roman Empire that will come later, as we've seen, they have a hard time uniting. They can, but it is relatively rare. Despite that, Greek culture, Greek influence, Greek politics, all of this will be extremely, extremely influential of course, not only in the ancient world, but far beyond the ancient world. Leaving them exhausted and vulnerable to a new rising power to the north. Right. For centuries, sophisticated Greeks had viewed the mountainous kingdom of Macedonia as a backwater, mm -hmm. Hicksville, barely Greek at all. And if we think about the geography of the region, what we're talking about is the Balkans, right? And so, especially at this point, the most populated region uh, in this entire area is Greece. Um, you know, and I'm talking about the sort of coastal ancient Greece. Don't necessarily think of the modern-day states of uh, the Balkans. You know, you got to turn your mind back a couple hundred, uh, sorry, a couple thousand years. The Balkans is a very mountainous region, and we'll see, even as we fast forward hundreds and hundreds of years, you penetrate deeper into the Balkans, it will still be fairly unpopulated uh, until quite a bit later. I mean, you'll see the Romans fighting against the Dacians in the Balkans, so it makes sense why a lot of these Greek city-states would look to the north and see what they would consider this sort of backwater, mountainous, rugged state of Macedonia. But under King Philip II, Macedonia emerged as a formidable military force. Right. His most famous reform? The introduction of the Sarissa, an 18-foot pike, twice the length of a normal Greek spear, and wielded by trained infantry fighting in close formation known as a phalanx. Mm -hmm. In 338 BC, at the Battle of Chironia, Philip's army crushed the joint forces of Thebes and Athens. Through alliance and conquest, Philip had already gained control over most of his neighbours. Now, following this victory, he united all Greece in an alliance known as the Hellenic League. Yes, Philip was, of course, a great leader and warrior, but he was also a wily politician. Now, he did make his fair share of enemies while doing this, and his life will be cut short prematurely under somewhat ambiguous circumstances, but you can tell he was a great leader, he was an intelligent politician, uh, he was a great general, all of these things 
need to be combined for him to achieve what he achieved. Or League of Corinth, with Philip as hegemon, or supreme commander. And so, you know, we're talking about how it's so hard for these Greek states to unite. And so what Philip does is he basically conquers them. A combination, like I said, of conquering and politicking, making alliances, forceful conquering. He brings them together under his leadership. Now, there's a lot of quibbling and a lot of these Greek city-states are not happy with that arrangement, but he does manage to do it. Uh, not entirely, as you can see, uh, some land to the south, mainly Sparta, is a uh, holdout, but he does a pretty good job of achieving this. Only Sparta stood aside. Philip began to plan a great campaign, a pan-Hellenic or all-Greek war against the Persian Empire. Yes. And to be clear, you know, uh, Sparta was this rather powerful militaristic culture. Uh, you might compare it to some of these other Greek city-states and say, oh, well, they were more prepared for warfare, they were more ready to fight. But one of the issues Sparta would face as time went on was that, you know, it sort of refused to reform. We've done some videos on this before, primarily Historia Civilis' video on Sparta's constitution. Reform was very difficult. And so Sparta was kept militarily ready, it didn't really progress and move forward as time continued. And so Sparta would fall into irrelevance after a long enough time. Their old foe was now an ailing superpower. Its great riches ripe for the taking. Yeah, well, it's been, you know, roughly 200 years since the time of Cyrus the Great. That's a long time for an empire to last. And as they said, the Achaemenid Empire seems right for the picking. But on the eve of launching his war, Philip was assassinated by his own bodyguard. Yes. And I say somewhat ambiguous circumstances. Uh, we know how he died. The ambiguous part is who exactly ordered this assassination? Of course, there's a lot of speculation that Alexander and his mother may have been involved. Uh, but we don't have the sources or evidence to necessarily back that up. A lot of it's speculation. Victim of Macedonia's brutal court rivalries. He was succeeded by his 20-year-old son, Alexander. 20. Restless. Younger than I am right now. 20 years old. Incredible. Tutored by the great philosopher Aristotle. <laughs> and not a bad. <laughs> experienced military commander. Hey, not a bad tutor. Alexander inherited his father's grand plan to invade Persia. But first, he had to secure his own position as king. Mm -hmm. At home, he had potential rivals executed. Then crushed rebellions in Illyria, Thessaly, and central Greece. He made a special example of Thebes, completely destroying the ancient city and yep. selling its people into slavery. And when he says completely destroying Thebes, man, we mean completely. This was an extremely brutal event of the ancient world. The city was destroyed, burned, ruined, and the people, as they said, were sold into slavery. Real brutal stuff. In the spring of 334 BC, now ready to launch his war against the Persian Empire, Alexander led his army across the Hellespont into Asia Minor. It was the start of one of the greatest military campaigns in history. Yeah, absolutely true. Now look, there's a lot you could say about Alexander. There are criticism, criticisms to be made about overextending and the longevity of his conquests, but putting all that aside, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of that later, just the campaign itself, if you just look at that in isolation, extraordinarily impressive. One of the most impressive military campaigns throughout history, easily. Alright, the Macedonian army. Good place to start. <laughs> the foundation of Alexander's the conquests. Alexander's army was about 40,000 strong, drawn Ooh. from all parts of Greece. The infantry were commanded by the veteran Macedonian general Parmenion. In the front rank, 9,000 Macedonian phalangites 
armed with the 18-foot Sarissa. These were professional soldiers, well-trained and drilled, who formed up for battle in the phalanx, 16 ranks deep. And I think that's what really put Macedonia and now Alexander. Of course, the groundwork has been laid by the work of his father, but this is what really put them ahead, were these trained soldiers. Not to say that other states didn't have trained soldiers, but, you know, it is rare to have this many skilled, highly disciplined trained soldiers. This is one of the things that would put, for example, the Roman Empire ahead. They have this Sarissa, they're using these relatively novel tactics, phalanx, and weaponry. They are highly disciplined, highly trained. The organization on all levels is very impressive, and that's what really puts Macedonia ahead of the competition. Of course, also the talents of Alexander himself, but he's been left a pretty good situation by his father. Alexander just needs to consolidate his power, which he's done, and then use what he's been left, which he does. <laughs> this packed formation presented a solid wall of iron spear tips and was virtually unstoppable. But it was also difficult to maneuver Yes. And highly vulnerable to attacks on its flanks or rear. And in the end, this will be what brings down the phalanx. Because eventually the phalanx will fall into obscurity. You know, we don't see the phalanx being used throughout classical history because of this flaw. It is not easy to maneuver. And if you're ready and prepared for it, then what you can do is you can flank it, you can maneuver around it and you can win yourself a victory. So 3,000 elite infantry, the Hypaspists, or shield bearers, armed with shorter spears, guarded its flanks. They were commanded by Parmenion's son, Nicanor. The second line of Alexander's army was made up of 7,000 Greek allies and 5,000 mercenaries, armed as hoplites. They took their name from the Hoplon, their large round shield, and carried shorter eight-foot spears. A hoplite phalanx was not as effective as the Macedonian phalangites, but still well armed and heavily armoured for the time. The Agrianes were the army's elite skirmishers, expert javelin throwers, from what's now southern Bulgaria. Other skirmishers from Thrace and Illyria were armed with javelins, slings and bows. And we can see, I was talking about how having, say, 9,000 of these trained, disciplined infantry soldiers was very impressive, and you can sort of see why. I mean, look at this army. Look how much it's broken down into different groups, different types of troops. Now, we're mostly talking about infantry, but infantry of vastly different levels of discipline, different levels of organization, uh, different levels of supply. <laughs> Some of these men will be far more heavily armored than others. This is how a lot of ancient armies were. They were divided between troops, mercenaries, allied troops, auxiliaries, and so having a core, and a core of 9,000, that's plus these 3,000 elite troops, that's relatively big, a core of these sort of elite, homegrown, trained soldiers. That's going to do a lot for you. The shock troops of Alexander's army were the Companion Cavalry. Yes. 1,800 elite horsemen, armed with spear and sword, commanded by Philotas, another son of Parmenion. Alexander led the royal squadron in person. The famous companion cavalry, though, we can see how infantry heavy this force was. Uh, same as the Romans did, they were very infantry heavy most of the time. We can look at other forces in the classical world that were more cavalry heavy, but when we look at this, we're talking mainly about infantry, though that doesn't mean that the cavalry cannot come in useful in really key moments. There were also 1,800 cavalry from Thessaly, commanded by Callas. Mm. 600 from other parts of Greece, led by Erigius. 
and 900 mounted scouts from Thrace and Paeonia under Cassander. The great Persian hmm. Empire was divided and here we have on the screen the modern day countries of the region and you can get a good look at how massive this Persian Empire was, the Achaemenid Empire, stretching all the way from Turkey in the west to Pakistan in the east. And this is what I meant when I said Alexander would reach right up to the Indian subcontinent at the sort of furthest extent east of the Persian Empire. ...into provinces called satrapies. Each satrapy was ruled by a governor or satrap. Mm -hmm. Those in Asia Minor, now threatened by Alexander's invasion, met to discuss strategy. And when we say Asia Minor, what we mean is Anatolia, and what that means basically is modern-day Turkey. So you think about the area that is modern-day Turkey, we often refer to that as Asia Minor or Anatolia. Memnon of Rhodes, a skilled Greek general in Persian service, urged them to avoid battle with Alexander. Hmm. Instead, he advised them to use a scorched earth strategy. Right. To burn villages and crops and withdraw to the interior. Alexander's army, he promised, would quickly starve. And you gotta feel bad for the people of Anatolia, <laughs> because this will often be a battleground between two competing forces, two great empires. I think of, say, fast forward a little bit, the Eastern Romans and the Persians, or the Caliphate and the Roman Empire. You know, farms are getting burned down in this area pretty often, basically, due to campaigning armies marching through. It was good advice, but the satraps were unwilling to lay waste to their own provinces without a fight. Mm. So they decided to face Alexander's army at the river Granicus. Okay. The Persian army formed up behind the river, which was shallow, but 60 feet wide with steep banks. Their front line was a wall of cavalry, about 10,000 horsemen from across the empire. And I was talking about armies that may be more cavalry heavy. I would say oftentimes we might find those a little further to the east. Uh, I think of a lot of these Persian empires, their armies were a little more heavy on the cavalry. Or if you're thinking much later, you might think of the Arab tribes or uh, the Caliphate. These forces were much more cavalry heavy than, say, Alexander's men were, or the Romans were. Medes and Hyrcanians from modern Iran, Bactrians from Afghanistan, and Paphlagonians from Turkey's Black Sea coast. Mm -hmm. And just like Alexander's army, the Persian army was split up between a variety of troops from across the empire, a variety of different ethnic groups. Behind, in reserve, were the infantry, several thousand Greek mercenaries, a common sight in Persian armies at this time. These men fought for Persian gold and were armed with the round shield and short spear of hoplites. Yep. And look, you'll see this a lot of times in the ancient world. In many cases, sort of loyalty to one state was not that strong. Now, there are absolutely important exceptions, but in many cases, men would go where the money was, you know? You may not have that much allegiance to wherever you were born. Sort of strong nationalism was not necessarily popular in a lot of places. Uh, nationalism is almost universal today, but that was not the case. Now, like I said, there were exceptions. If you were, say, a citizen of somewhere like Athens, you would probably feel pretty strong loyalty to Athens. But first off, not everyone was from Athens. And second off, most people who lived in the area were not citizens. So when you think about it, it's not really that confusing that a lot of these Greeks would go and fight for the Persian army. If the money is there, that's where they're going to go. 
The Persians may have been unsure if they could trust these men in combat against fellow Greeks. Right. There's that, but also this can be generalized to mercenaries more broadly. <laughs> if you have mercenaries, they tend to cut and run when given the opportunity. If they see the battle isn't going well, well, they're just in this for money. They're not necessarily trying to get killed, so they'll cut and run. They'll get out of here. And if they're fighting fellow Greeks, maybe there's an even higher chance of disloyalty. And so placed them at the rear. Alexander, determined to attack and destroy this Persian force before it could retreat, raced to the Granicus with his best troops. Okay. On his left wing, he posted Thessalian, Greek, and Thracian cavalry under Parmenian's command. In the center were the massed spears of the phalanx, its six divisions commanded by Perdiccas, Koinos, Amintas, Philip, Meliager, and Crateros. On the right, Alexander himself, with the companion cavalry under Philotas, mm -hmm. as well as the elite hypaspists, the Agrianes javelin throwers, and the archers. Alexander, with 13,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry in all, was probably slightly outnumbered. Yeah, but maybe not too badly. Slightly outnumbered, but... This does seem to be a relatively even matchup, though the Persians have been able to select the battlefield, so that does give them an advantage. Now let's see if they can use that advantage to win. But ignoring advice to wait until dawn to cross the river, he ordered an immediate assault. He sent a squadron of companion cavalry to ford the river, hmm. followed by a regiment of hypaspists and the Paeonian light cavalry. Alexander, calling on his men to show their courage, then led his right wing across the river. As they reached the middle of the river, the Greeks came under a hail of javelins, darts and arrows from the Persian line. Those that made it to the far bank were immediately charged by the Persian cavalry, Yeah, I mean, this is a very bold move. You know, this is a risky crossing. You may be slightly outnumbered, but more than that, you're performing a river crossing. Now, they said the river wasn't necessarily deep, but that still puts you in a dangerous position. You are vulnerable to enemy attack. Even here, we can see the confidence of Alexander, and he was confident, some would say to a fault, uh, he really, truly believed in his own victory, but hey, when you see all of his conquests, you start to understand why, but even from the beginning, Alexander has this pure belief in what he's doing, and he's just going to go for it. Alexander was in the thick of the fighting. Yep. Like I said, pure confidence and belief. So much that he would put himself in the thick of the fighting. He was not worried about losing his own life. In fact, he was, I think, extremely confident that he was going to make it. You know, there is a bit of chatter about Alexander feeling himself uh, divine in some way. Um, I don't know too much about that. Uh, I know that he, I think his mother sort of told him these things that made himself believe that he truly was either blessed with a divine mission or divine himself in some way. And so he's not afraid to put himself in the most dangerous of situations. He doesn't think he's going to die. He attacked where the whole mass of their cavalry and leaders were stationed. Around him, a desperate conflict raged. Horses were jammed against horses and men against men. The Macedonians striving to drive the Persians away from the riverbank. The Persians determined to prevent them crossing and to push them back into the river. Alexander's attack seemed reckless, 
but he was buying time for the rest of his army to cross the river, mm. including the irresistible Macedonian phalanx. And that seems to have been Alexander's bet in this battle. Now, of course, there's that pure confidence that I talked about. But he's also, like they said, buying time for the phalanx to make it across the river. And we've already talked about how these Macedonian phalanxes were extremely well disciplined, powerful in this era of warfare. Uh, they were really sort of top of the line, you know, the new novel way of doing things. And I suppose he's thinking, look, if we can get most of our men over this river, then we can start pushing the Persians back and they're not going to stand a chance. Then, suddenly, Alexander was fighting for his life, charged by two Persian nobles. Roissasis rode up to Alexander and struck him on the head with his sword, breaking off a piece of his helmet. But the helmet broke the force of the blow, and Alexander struck him down with his lance. Hmm. Then, from behind, Spithridates raised his sword against the king, but Black Clytus son of Dropidus, anticipated his blow, struck his arm, and cut it off, sword and all. Wow. <laughs> and I think even though Alexander already has that belief in himself, that belief that he's going to make it, he's going to succeed, if you go through one, or many, as he will, of these battles where you face death and you survive every single time, that's only going to bolster, to reinforce that confidence and belief in yourself and your mission. Now the Greek army was across the river, and the Persian cavalry faced a wall of Macedonian spears. Most turned and fled. Yep. speed and shock of Alexander's attack meant Persia's Greek mercenaries hadn't even had time to join the battle. <laughs> Alexander, in a blood rage, or possibly regarding these Greeks as traitors, ignored their appeals for mercy. The mercenaries were surrounded on all sides and massacred. Well, we've seen two acts of brutality in this video alone from what I've seen. And I only know really about sort of the early life of Alexander. A lot of this series after this point will be unknown territory for me, but from what I've seen, Alexander was not a man who was merciful. <laughs> you know, you, you should not be asking for mercy from this man. Uh, he was going 100%, and if he felt like you'd betrayed him or you deserved it, he would absolutely go in and commit atrocities. Alexander had won a great victory. Asia Minor now lay at his mercy. But the Persian Empire was still a land of immense wealth and power. Oh yeah, look, Asia Minor, Anatolia, definitely not a loss that the Persian Empire would want, but if we're talking about the wealth of the Achaemenid Empire, the strength, the center, you know, it's not Asia Minor. <laughs> you gotta go further east. That is where you're gonna find the most prosperous lands of this sprawling empire. So, though Alexander has already won an impressive victory, he's already pushing eastwards, he still has a long way to go before his most impressive victories. Already, it was mobilizing its vast resources to face him. Yeah. If Alexander was to conquer this empire and take his place in history, he'd next have to face Darius, King of Kings himself. King of Research. Kings, Shan Shah, the title that the emperor, the king of the Persian Empire would take. How about that? All right, that was a good episode. I very much enjoyed that. I'm real excited to see the rest of Alexander's journey. Epic History TV does a fantastic job, as always. Um, I decided to start with this series because I really like Epic History TV, and it's sort of a 
fairly condensed way to do the story of Alexander. I know there are other series and videos on Alexander out there. I know Kings and Generals has a more extended series on Alexander. Uh, we might do that in the long term, but I felt like this was a good place to start. Uh, and once again, if you have other Alexander-related reactions that you would like me to do, then please leave them down below in the comments. And also, in reference to the poll that I had a couple of weeks ago, uh, which series did you want me to react to? This one was the winner. If you supported one of those other options, don't worry, I will do all of them in the long run as well. Um, but, you know, we only have so much time. We, we got to choose one to start with and then go. Uh, so it might take a while to get to some of them, but after this, sort of soon-ish after we finish this series, I intend to do uh, Invicta's uh, Avenging Varus ser series on Germanicus, because I know a lot of you have been wanting that for a while, and that's also one that I am interested in. So stay tuned for that after we're done with all this Alexander stuff. All right. So with all of that out of the way, uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon, all that good stuff. Uh, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.